until the oh, okay. Pam just starts the meeting. Yeah. Oh, I didn't say any panelists either. You're right. Okay. <clears throat> All right, Mr. Marshall Amherst Media is in the house. You are a co-host to this meeting. There's Fred. Mr. Hartwell is now joining us. Uh, my clock says 6.33. The attendees are coming in. At this point, we have about 12 of them that I see. Um, it looks like we are good to go. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Welcome to the Amherst Planning Board meeting of August 16th, 2023. My name is Doug Marshall, and as the chair of the Amherst Planning Board, I am calling this meeting to order at 6.33 p.m. This meeting is being recorded and is available live stream via Amherst Media. Minutes are being taken. Pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021 and extended by Chapter 2 of the Acts of 2023, this planning board meeting, including public hearings, will be conducted via remote means using the Zoom platform. The Zoom meeting link is accessible on the meeting agenda posted on the town website's calendar listing for this meeting, or go to the planning board webpage and click on the most recent agenda, which lists the Zoom link at the top of the page. No in-person attendance of the public is permitted. However, every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the meeting in real time via technological means. In the event we are unable to do so for reasons of economic hardship or despite best efforts, we will post an audio or video recording, transcript, or other comprehensive record of proceedings as soon as possible after the meeting on the Town of Amherst, Amherst website. Board members, I will take a roll call. When I call your name, unmute yourself, answer affirmatively, and return to mute. Bruce Colden. I'm here. Thank you. Fred Hartwell. I am here. Thank you. Jesse Mager. Present. I, Doug Marshall, I'm present. Janet McGowan? Here. Uh, we believe that Johanna Newman will be absent for this meeting. And Karen Winter. Looks like, looks like we lost Karen. Oh, there she is. I'm Hello. here. You're here. Okay. okay, good. There we go. Thank you all. Board members, if technical issues arise, we may need to pause to fix the problem and then continue the meeting. If the discussion needs to pause, it will be noted in the minutes. Please use the raise hand function to ask a question or make a comment. I will see your request and call on you to speak. After speaking, re remember to remute yourself. To the general public, the general public comment item on our agenda is reserved for public comment regarding items not uh, as specific subjects on tonight's agenda. Please be aware the board will not respond to comments during general public comment period. Public comment may also be heard at other times during the meeting when determined appropriate by the planning board chair. Please indicate you wish to make a comment by clicking the raise hand button when public comment is solicited. If you have joined the Zoom meeting using a telephone, please indicate you wish to make a comment by pressing star nine on your phone. When called on, please identify yourself by stating your full name and address and put yourself back into mute when finished speaking. Residents can express their views for up to three minutes or at the discretion of the planning board chair. If a speaker does not comply with these guidelines or exceeds their allotted time, their participation may be disconnected from the meeting. Okay, so the time now is 6.37 and we are, we've come to the first item on the agenda, which is approval of minutes. Uh, tonight's minutes are the minutes from our meeting of July 19th. Uh, does anybody have any comments on the, these minutes as drafted by our uh, highly capable staff? Janet. Um, I just wanted to say, I thought they were excellent and the minutes have been really great lately. And then I'm happy to make a motion to accept them. Okay. Uh, why don't I go ahead and second that? Uh, sorry, Bruce. Um, 
And uh, Chris, you had raised your hand. So I received an email today from the applicant on the Eversource project, and um, I had sent him a copy of the decision, and he noted that <clears throat> College Street was spelled Cottage Street in the decision. So I see that it's also spelled that way in the um, minutes. So that would be on page five and possibly another place. I'm not sure. Anyway, so I'm suggesting that that um, that wor that uh, spelling be corrected. Oh, yeah. Minutes. Yep. I see it on page five under the site visit. All right. Um, Bruce, you all right with the amending or uh, Janet. Janet, you, you, uh, with amending your motion for uh, in my motion to make the spelling correction. Okay, and I agree with that as the seconder. Thanks, Chris. Anybody else have any other comments on these minutes? Okay, we'll go through and have a vote. Uh, Bruce, we'll start with you. I approve, and I also thought they were very thorough. All right. Uh, Fred. Fred, you are. Yes. Yeah. yeah, I just unmuted. Um, unless my vote is required, I will abstain because I was not on the board for this meeting. OK. Well, let's see how that goes. Jesse. Excuse me. I believe Mr. Hartwell was on the board for the July 19th meeting. It was the June 21st meeting that oh. he wasn't on board. So. <laughs> Yeah, my my bad. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I, yeah, you I, are I, listed as present. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> for some reason, I I read that and I read it as uh, never mind. Uh, mm. <laughs> that's on me, and I'll vote yes. Okay. Thank you, Jesse. I approve. All right, Janet. Hi. Thank you. And Karen. I approve. And I'm an I as well. So the motion passes, six in favor, one absent. Great. Uh, Chris, um, are we entirely up to speed on minutes or are some of them outstanding? Some of them are outstanding. I think the August 2nd meeting is not, um, hasn't been, uh, fully transcribed. And also, I have a confession to make that the March 29th meeting, which was the last time the planning board met in person, has not been, um, the minutes of that of that meeting have not been done. But I think other than those two, um, that we're good. If okay. Ms. Um, Field Sadler agrees with me. I do agree. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay. And are you... Uh... I promise I will You're write. Confident we'll get caught up. The twenty ninth meeting. Okay. Yes. Because we're we're about to have another you know third meeting of the month, and I don't want to mm -hmm. get in the situation we were in last year. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good. So that's that's it for minutes. Uh, time is six forty one. At this time, we'll go to public comment period. And so, members of the public. Uh, actually, before we do that, members of the public, you can get ready to raise your hand uh, if you want to say anything during this public comment period. Bruce, I see your hand. Why don't you make your comment? You are muted, Bruce. Possible point of order. It, it, uh, we're in a situation where there's an item on the agenda, which we may decide not to have on the agenda. And uh, it may be that folks in the meeting were waiting to have that. So I was wondering how you would want to handle that. I guess if we were to say we didn't want to consider it tonight, could we still have public comment on that item? Or, I mean, how, how do you how do you think we should handle it? Um, well, uh, you know, we, the 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 topic that you're referring to, which is the Shootsbury. Uh, Massachusetts solar project um, was not going to be a public hearing. Um, okay. And so actually public comment would not be required to be given for that for that topic. Um, I think, um, you know, we, we will, when we get to that, probably 
uh, we will explain that the the uh, applicant has withdrawn the request. Are, you know, has declined to show up tonight and um, wants to reschedule that for another time. Um, so members of the public, uh, we're really not going to talk about uh, the Shootsbury Solar Project tonight, I believe. And so if, if, if you want to make a public comment about that at this time, I guess go ahead and put your hand up. Um, but as I said, we're really not going to talk about that this evening. So thanks, Bruce, for bringing that up. So uh, with that discussion at this point, I see one hand uh, raised for public comment. And actually, at this time, I usually read the names of the people who are in the participant list or in the uh, attendee list, rather. So I see uh, that there are 12 attendees, Eric Bachrock, Bruno Caloro, Carlos Fontes, Connor Burgess, uh, Larry, Martha Hanner, Mara Keen, Michael Lipinski, Pam Rooney, Renee Moss, Shane Bajnochi, uh, uh, I'm sure I butchered that, and someone first name Tom. Okay, so Eric Bachrock has his hand up for making a public comment. Uh, Pam, if you could bring Eric over. Uh, and just a reminder, this is for topics not on tonight's agenda. So that can include the uh, Shootsbury Solar Project, which we're probably not going to be discussing. So welcome, Eric. Please give us your full name and your street address, assuming you live in Amherst. I do, Doug. Thank you very much. Uh, I assume you can hear me. Yes, we can. Uh, my name is Eric Backrack. I live at 277. Shootsbury Road in Amherst, and uh, in, in respecting the um, uh, the procedures of the planning committee, I was not going to refer to the uh, third the third agenda item, the solar project on Shootsbury Road, um, uh, which was uh, the application was withdrawn for at least from discussion. I was going to ask why because I was given a heads up recently that this application was um, continued for a discussion by the planning board uh, to September 6th. So I'm wondering how, um, how uh, the planning board, uh, you know, it was, uh, it was moved off of today's agenda because it was an incomplete application and how that application it will still be incomplete as of September 6th, how it could be considered uh, for discussion by uh, the planning board um, and make making recommendations <clears throat> on the application, albeit incomplete, to the ZBA on September 6th. So I am confused and I my, it defies my imagination as how, why if it, it was removed from tonight's agenda item, how it could be considered nonetheless on September 6th. Thank okay. you. Very, thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Mr. Bachrock. Um, as, as I said earlier, we typically don't respond to public comments uh, directly. Um, Chris, I saw your hand and I, do you want to say anything now or do you want to wait until we get to the next item on the agenda? I'll wait. Thank you. Okay. All right, uh, with that, uh, the time now is 647. We'll go to the third item on the agenda, uh, which is the uh, ZBA FY 2023-18 project with uh, ASD Shootsbury Mass Solar uh, LLC, uh, the request for a special permit. So Chris, do you wanna say anything to to, oh, I, I'm sorry, you're, you're coughing at the moment. Um, caught you at a bad moment. I, <clears throat> I would like to read um, the email that I received from Tom Reedy today. And Tom Reedy is the attorney for the, um, the applicant in the case of the Shootsbury Road Solar. 
He says, um, Chris, and he's really addressing the planning board, please accept this email as a request for a continuation of the Shutesbury Road solar discussion currently scheduled for this evening with the planning board. As you likely know, we are confirming our wetland delineation and intend on presenting the project concept to the ZBA next Thursday, the 24th, with the expectation that it will be heard in earnest in October. In the interim, we will be working with the Conservation Commission toward an updated order of resource area delineation. We'd be happy to present the project to the planning board on September 20th. Please let us know if that is acceptable. And I will ask the planning board to let me know if that is acceptable to hear about this project on September 20th. All right, thank you, Chris, and uh, thank Tom for the email. Um, so Chris, my first question to you is whether we have other agenda items that are planned for September 20th and whether we have time that evening to talk about it. As far as I know, we do not have other uh, items planned for that night. Um, <clears throat> so. Okay. No. And September 20th would still be in advance of the majority of the zoning board deliberations on the project. Is that expected to be true? That is correct. Okay. All right. So board members, uh, are there any objections to us planning to discuss that on September 20th? Anybody? Bruce? I, I don't have any objection, but I'll be out of the country. So that's possibly should to be said. But uh, I, th I think since the uh, members of the public are still here, I, I think it's important to point out that uh, um, we have, uh, on occasions, uh, in, as, as recently as last meeting, uh, conducted a, a, a hearing, and it was in our case a hearing and not even a, 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 a consideration for recommendation to another uh, authority having jurisdiction prior to a completion of a Conservation Commission hearing. So there's nothing magic about uh, needing all other agencies, particularly when we are sitting to make a recommendation, you want to get that in earlier. Um, so uh, there seems to be confusion, at least in the in the public, fra the fraction of the public who have been sending us emails, that somehow or other there's a breach of protocol or law or etiquette or maybe even common sense, but that's kind of our business, about whether we should uh, spend time uh, on these kind of things before all of the allied agencies have completed their work and the answer is we frequently do this so there's nothing uh, untoward about this i just thought i would like to say that well thank you bruce i appreciate you bringing that up and i will you know repeat or remind people that this uh our our decision to hear about this project was entirely optional um we could have simply said, oh, we don't want to hear about it, and ZBA can just go ahead and deliberate without any input from us. Uh, and in fact, whenever we do hear about, about the project, we may decide not to give any recommendation uh, on the project. So uh, it's quite flexible. Uh, Janet. Um, so I two things. So we're not doing this on September 6th, which was the one email. So now we're on the 20th, correct? Um, the and then 20th is, is, is the new date. Okay. And then vis-a-vis -vis the wetlands delineation, you know, I unless there, like to me, if there's a huge difference between what we're presented with and what the con, -con comes up with, you know, that might be something we like I mean, that might change our outlook on the project or significantly change the project. If it's not expected to change um, much, I don't think it has a huge impact, but, but I do think, you know, like that might impact the ZBA's decision about whether to go forward with the hearing. Cause sometimes we kind of wait on our decisions and wait for the con con to come in and things like that. So, you know, I think it's a little bit of a murky area, but if it's a really different if there's like a stream discovered or they're moving the array really significantly, that could affect how we look at it. And I guess we could just see it twice then, right? Yeah, I mean, we could talk about it, what they've submitted so far and have comments on that and then, you know, see what how it changes. I, I guess I, I suspect that within, between two, two, a period of two years, 
it's not likely that the, the, the extent of wetlands has actually changed that much, although it has been very rainy this, this past year. So yeah, okay. we'll just have to see. And I, I doubt I will bother to compare the, whatever we get in our packet on for September 20th with what we got tonight. You know, it's like, that's, that's old news. I don't need to see that. Okay, uh, are there any other board comments on, on that topic? Uh, if not, we'll, we'll just go ahead and move on to the next item on our agenda and plan to revisit this question on the 20th. Okay, I don't see any hands. All right, and so the time now, 6.53 and we'll move to the item four, old business. Uh, the first item on old business is uh, concerns SPR 2023 from ServiceNet Incorporated um, at 10, 12 and 20 Belchertown Road, review of conditions of site plan approval prior to issuance of a building permit. When we approved the, the site plan, for this project, we had a couple of conditions. Uh, one concerned the lighting plan and, and the photometric plan for the site. Uh, wanted to see catalog cuts of the exterior lighting prior to the issuance of the building permit. And we wanted to see uh, the final architectural plans. So uh, looks like we have Larry has joined us, and so welcome, Larry. If you can unmute and introduce yourself, and uh, maybe you can lead present uh, the materials that you're back to show us tonight. Yes, thank thank you. Uh, my name is Larry Tuttle. I'm the architect of record for ServiceNet on the particular project. Uh, I've had submitted some of the initial drawings. Uh, for the proposed work on the building, but have focused primarily on the building and, and not on the site. That was uh, handled by Levesque. Um, and uh, as such, some, some of the items we had called for a pre-construction meeting as part of the conditions a few weeks back uh, with a miscommunication because we were really looking to secure a permit to do some investigative work on the building that consisted of some controlled demolition of the finishes so that we could see structural issues that we had some questions about. Uh, that unfortunately followed suit with, with the communication problems because we did not receive that authorization to proceed uh, promptly enough to have before the committee right now finished architectural drawings because we did discover much to the dismay of the owners uh, some structural issues that have to be addressed and engineered so those drawings have not been completed we had at the time of that early meeting had been encouraged that we would be able to investigate the conditions much sooner and we had a, a chance for finished drawings submitted before you. But we did try to address, as we've interpreted, the conditions of approval in so far as that we have provided missing pieces that were identified and Chris has been very helpful uh, in that process, I've I've sent some uh, drawings to her. She's pointed out some of the discussions that happened at the earlier meetings that I was not part party to, um, and so I've made some of those corrections that that she has been looking for. So I think before the the board right now, there is a photometric study. Uh, we do have the light fixture cuts. We have two options for the <clears throat> parking area. One where it's a pole mounted fixture that has a uh, cutoff so it, it does comply with dark sky requirements. 
it has minimal lighting into the parking area. And so the alternative is to have the fixture mounted on a, a projecting arm from the pole. And it gives a, still a soft light on the parking area, which uh, again, we've submitted photometrics for that. The one thing that Christine had, had pointed out was that we did not address the gable end of the building, the west end of the building. And by program, that is right now paved and was part of the, the restaurant parking lot, but it is not necessarily parking area that is to be utilized by the current applicant. And so we were hopeful of just putting as at the entries to the units, a photo, uh, a motion sensitive uh, wall sconce that would just wash down the building and, and the immediate foreground and not project out in towards the street at all. Uh, so that that's where we stand with the, the photometrics. Uh, there was also a question about the ramp and I initially sent in a ramp scheme that was of a concrete ramp. Unbeknownst to me, it had been discussed and, and is the preference of the owners to do a framed ramp. And so I had a secondary sheet sent into the board with a framed version of that. And I'm currently reviewing the acceptability of a decking material that the applicant has used on other projects, but I wanna make sure is compliant with the conditions that we're uh, proposing right now. But it is, it is a decked wood framed and railing combination that I think had been discussed and was the more favorable response that the, the board was looking for. And it is also the same railing and decking material that would create the stairs and small landing at the entries of each of the units. So, uh, Mr. Tuttle, I, I should I conclude you're not going to be sharing your screen and showing us any of your materials? Um, I wasn't prepared to do so. I thought that by sending it into <laughs> Christine that that was that was potentially uh, if yeah, something had to be distributed. So I apologize if that was an expectation. Okay. Mr. Uh, Marshall, so when, when Mr. You Marshall say, well, sorry. I was just going to say, I have all the documents available yeah, to share. Yeah. So if there's something you want to see, just let me know. Okay. okay. Well, it sounds like there's a couple of alternates on the... Uh, mm -hmm light fix the exterior light fixtures illuminating the parking lot yep. and uh, as I look through my packet here I'm seeing what may be those alternates but I wanted to make sure I understood it correctly yeah the, the biggest difference in the alternates on the lighting is the the armature from the pole that will give a, a more even light more to the center of the parking than the very first photometrics that I set, sent with the set uh, was just a strict pole mounted fixture that has the cutoff angle. There was no spill onto the abutters, but it also, because of the cutoff, didn't carry as far into the center of the parking area. So that, that was a question of whether we wanted more of a, a soft light at the perimeter, but then you lose the, some of that light value towards the center of the parking versus if you have it on this projecting arm, you, we bring that light level more to the center of the, of the lot. All right, so can you see the screen at the moment, Mr. Tuttle? Whoops, yep. go back, go uh, back that to you... that catalog cut. Yeah. It was the same fixture. It was just that that fixture would be on an arm that would be projecting from the pole. 
Okay. All right. And then, all right. So, uh, and we wouldn't, and we wouldn't have to have the sharp angle that it's shown there to throw the light forward. It could be more horizontal. Okay. All right. Um, board members, I see a couple of hands. Bruce, you got there first. Yeah, so, Larry, I guess, therefore, the two uh, photometric uh, plan diagrams we have, the one of them represents the lighting with the fixture as configured as shown. Yes. And the other represents the lighting with the arm. Now, this Correct. arm, how long is it? Uh, it's about eight feet, I believe. Oh, okay. So basically, it's working just to push the uh, the light. The light source. The hole. Yes, the light the source. Can, the center it, of the. And we so, can lessen the angle of the fixture itself, so it's more horizontal. So, can we uh, can we look at those two uh, mm -hmm. um, photometric diagrams? Mm -hmm. Um, I looked at these before, and it seemed to me that the uh, um, that uh, this is the one that gives the this is this is the one with the that's pole mounted pole mounted without the arm. Yes, right. So that you can see the intensity adjacent or surrounding the pole and projecting only a minimal amount into the parking yes. area that would be used. So I that's think, why yeah. we investigated uh, an armature uh, mounting. Yes. So um, it's it's not hugely different, but it's, no, it's but, improved. Uh, it's improved. Yes. <laughs> One lumen is, um, I mean, basically the bulk of the area of the uh, parking area is at least one lumen Per yes. square foot and uh, from my memory when I used to wander around with uh, light meters and so forth to kind of get a sense of all of this stuff that uh, 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 one lumen per square foot in my recollection is what you would expect to see uh, I don't know about five or ten feet outside of a of a uh, well it's it's you can actually see a fair bit at one lumen Unless yes. you've uh, unless you've just been staring at a bright light, right? Um, so uh, so either of those photometric diagrams would seem to me to be satisfactory in terms of the light lighting levels, um, but it sounds to me as though we might prefer from uh, from from the general um, um, a glare uh, control point of view to have the uh, to have the more horizontally mounted fixture so it's uh, it's it's uh, so that it's not facing people uh, some in from some aspects if it's uh, slightly inclined or up you know uh, tilted upwards it's going to be more of a glare source for people in certain uh, areas and probably in the parking area behind the building so i would uh, i would uh, think uh, um, that the uh, the uh, the option with the arm might be a more satisfactory uh, end result, not so much from the the lighting level that it distributes, although to some degree, but mostly because of the glare reduction from certain aspects that would probably happen as a consequence. Well, is that uh, so? I guess Larry, I could ask you: Would you agree with that? Well, that that's why that second one was looked at. Yeah, uh, because it did make the the fixture horizontal or more so, and not angled to try to push that light level uh, into the center. So so I agree with that uh, assessment. And accordingly, I think I would pref recommend that we uh, pr uh, prefer um, the second the, option. The second option, the one that's, oh, the one that's now, this one. This is the one that uh, shows the, uh, I think if I recall, Yes. Yes. Think, yes. Yes. This is the one. Is. Yes. So this is the uh, this is the photometric diagram that that accords to the uh, arm uh, uh, arm mounted uh, fixture and with its configuration more horizontally. Um, I wanted to ask about the what the pole height is uh, when you mentioned that there's an eight foot that the arm option has an eight foot arm. 
Uh, how does that, what sort of, how does that compare to the height of the pole? It, it is near the upper part of the pole, just where the fixtures are mounted presently. Um, but what I mean so, is how high is the pole? How high is the fixture? Uh, hmm. <laughs> I mean, if, you know, if it were a 16 foot pole and an eight foot, yeah. off, I would think that would look pretty strange. Um, oh, I see what you're saying. The proportion of the height and yeah, the projected the, you know, fixture. The way the pole looks and whether it looks odd. Yeah, we, we were attempting to utilize the pole uh, position for the utility that exists there versus a placement of a new pole. Oh, so um, this, is, this is an existing pole. Yeah, so we, we're working from those fixed points uh, and trying to get the, the best wash of light in that parking area. I see. Um, well, I, I have... If I could butt in for a moment, uh, down at the bottom there, it says mounting height and uh, 16 feet, uh, uh, the, the mounting heights are given um, yeah, so at the end of that uh, yeah. luminous schedule. Yeah. I don't know, I, I guess, uh, I also noticed that with this arm option, some of the uh, lumens are actually lower right in front of the main building. There's a whole bunch of them that are below one. Well, and that, that too is a study done with the parking lot lighting uh, with limited input from any of the sconces. Because that's what we were we were evaluating in this second application. Okay. So if there are if some of the sconces were on, you'd have an increase of lighting level there. Right. Right at the building. Uh, so do you guys or does ServiceNet have a preference? I guess that's addressed to, <laughs> to Larry and Connor. Uh, uh, Connor here, I'm going to say ServiceNet does not have a preference. Okay. All right. Uh, Janet. <clears throat> I... Looking at the photometric plans, I just wanted to clarify what I think is my understanding. The little red dots are the poles, where the poles are going to go. And the sconces are not on this. They're not shown on this plan. The the, sconce, the sconces are shown at the, the face of the building, at the entryways, flanking the entryways. Are they in a color, or are they just that little? Uh, they are also a red notation. Okay. At the face of the building. So that each entryway, and the only thing missing on this would be uh, a couple of those same sconces on the gable end where we don't show any lighting. So so one of my thoughts was that the lighting on the um with the tall arm for the for the few units to the right is very low but but it's i presumed it would be lit well by the, the sconces and you know be kind of so i i that's that was my understanding so i hope that's true and then when i looked at the um uh the site the overall site plan i had trouble locating the lights on that so i wonder if, if pam if we could go to that um i think it's w1 maybe f and it says overall site plan and that, that may be indicated by something I just, there's no color to it. So I just wanted just to have an assist on transferring to like where the parking lot is and the green space and things like that. Let's see, yeah. Uh, thank you, Pam. You're welcome. So could someone just sort of say, oh, the light, the light poles are here, like a little circle the way Andrew used to do or Maybe Pam. Can... Somebody wants to guide uh, me. Let's see. They're going to be, if I'm remembering. Yeah. There's one over Roll here. A little bit. Yeah. And there's one at the very bottom. It's not it's on the green space, right? Around in here. Um, 
it is in the in the green space. It's just up above the. There's a tree. It's like in the middle of that row of trees that parallels okay. the street. So it looks like a soccer ball, kind of. Is and, that? Um, no, that? Those are, tree, to your those left. are trees. To your it's left. To the left. To your left. Right. To your left. Down. Now, down, down straight down. There. 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 There's up. a little dot above the. Ah, uh, right here. That's wow. the pole. Okay, challenging, challenging, but I understand it. <laughs> so, okay, so that, okay, that, that helps me. And that pole exists now. Correct. And then I remember where there's going to be new green space on the right-hand side. There was a pole there. And yes, are you, it, are, is that disappearing? I just have to remember, or is that just being repurposed? That, that's being reused. It's not going to impact the green space. But, and again, with the armature, it's bringing the light out onto the pavement more so than just in the green space. Okay. And then I, I can sort of extrapolate where maybe if I can look at the one in the parking lot, I'll find a dot there. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I was just a little concerned for sufficiency of lighting for the people who, you know, have the um, units on the right, but if the sconce is lighting them, it's probably nice not to have a huge amount of light over the green space for the beasts and there's a stream there and things like that. So um, I do have, I do slightly share, I do share D Doug's concern that it looks like kind of a giant, I mean like a giant insect arms coming out, but maybe just if it's dark, it just disappears. I don't know. I would go it, with the Yeah, I, I would hope that it's not gonna draw attention. It's gonna be that the light source uh, is not directly mounted to the pole. Is is real? You're gonna you're gonna sense the light source more than the pole at this you're point. Trying, you're trying to put the light where you want it, not. And I understand that. Right. Thank you. All right. Um, so, board members, uh, do you do we think that we want to make a express a preference to ServiceNet about the two lighting conditions, or just let them decide? Uh, I know Bruce has expressed one preference. I think I actually have the opposite preference. So maybe this is uh, something others may have an opinion about. Bruce. Yeah, my preference is uh, not strong. And it might be. Well, I, don't, uh, I don't think mine is either. So, yeah. you know, I think. And, it, and, and who knows, it might look better if it had a six foot arm or a five foot arm than an eight foot arm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I was thinking, however, that uh, particularly in the in the one at the, at the, at the let's just say the bottom there in that triangular white space, as I know we talked about these trees here and we thought that they would be no higher than 15 feet. So, but we do have a sixteen foot mounting height. So these getting the getting the uh, the 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 fixture out beyond the the trees so with a, at least some arm of, of at least four feet or five feet or so probably would be a good idea. I don't know how the vegetation will grow up in the certainly in the one on the upper uh, left hand side. There are no trees in that area, so that's not impinged. But in the uh, over to the uh, eastern side. The right hand side uh, i'm not sure um how that vegetation would affect the light so but probably an arm there would push it out a little bit beyond whatever vegetation might be grown so i still have that mild preference okay but but not strong well let's see what what fred thinks he's got his hand up and he's worked got the electrical background yeah I, um i'm weekly with bruce on this uh um, okay <laughs> and uh I could be talked out of it, but I will point out that uh, I have considerable experience with the town streetlights, having retired as the electrical division supervisor for the DPW. And uh, there are a number of places and public streets in Amherst where uh, streetlights are on eight foot arms. Uh, quite frequently, more frequently shorter, but there are a bunch of eight foot arms and it, it doesn't seem untoward to me. So okay, uh, I'm gonna support Bruce on this one. Okay, sounds good. So we've got, have looks like we have a, a preference uh, as, as uh, in terms of board members who've expressed a preference uh, for the arms. 
Um, does anybody else want to weigh in or should we just say we have a slight preference to ServiceNet for the ARM solution? All right, I don't see anybody, any, any other hands. So let's see, Larry, was, were there any other decisions that we needed to make? Uh, it sounded like you were still working on the structure of the ramp. Um, um, yes, it is going to be a framed ramp. We do have a depiction of it. It's really a selection of decking material um, okay. and that we are confirming uh, since we're using it on a handicap ramp, that it's compatible with ADA and AAB uh, regulations within the state because it is a Canadian-made product. So we're we're doing our due diligence on on that usage. Okay, but it's it's location and configuration is is not uh, altered. All right. Than what what is depicted here? Great. Okay, so uh, board members, are there any other any other comments or feedback you want to offer uh, to ServiceNet? Bruce, I see your hand. I'm just bringing up my email. Uh, Chris said that uh, um, in a in an email from August nine said that the stairs at entryways need handrails, and and I whoops and that that shown and um, I. I just want to confirm that uh, that that uh, this is this diagram that we're looking at now, which is more recent than August nine. Uh, yes. That we we now uh, so that Chris's comment is now moot because it is currently shown. As I I mean, when I looked at this, I thought, well, it appears to me to be uh, handrail shown and so forth. So um, so we're comfortable in saying in approving this diagram that we are. I guess this is a question for Chris. If if we approve this diagram, Chris, we're comfortable with the handrail requirements, I think. Is that correct? Go ahead, Chris. I do not think so because um, I believe that the handrail is supposed to project out beyond the step. Isn't that correct? If you're if you're really having um, a handrail um, is um, complying with handicapped requirements. That's a that's a code. Uh, I would put that in Rob Morris' department um, rather than ours, but uh, very likely yes. So that is my understanding. So previously, Mr. Tuttle had sent a drawing, which I think you had in your packet, um, showing a metal handrail. Yeah, or PVC. Yes. Yep. And that so did I, have the projection. I wondered why you wouldn't just um, have keep the metal handrail in all the locations rather than switch to a um, wooden handrail in uh, the location where the where the stairs are. Um, if you have a metal handrail along the ramp, um, and then Mr. Tuttle had sent a drawing that showed the stairs coming down from the ramp as having a metal handrail, um, yep. why wouldn't you also keep a metal handrail at the stairs that come out of the building? Um, for the entryways. In, in other words, make it all compatible. I oh, Personally, oh. I don't care which choice you make, but make it compatible and make it co comply Consistent. with ADA requirements. That's what I'm saying. Okay. All right. Well, that's, that, that's fair because we were scrambling after we showed the concrete with the tubular handrail. Uh, I learned that it had been the preference of the owners, and Connor can can speak to this, that the framed met, the framed unit was the preferred. And so we quickly submitted that, what you see in front of you with the frame. But we could we could still put the grasping handrail portion could be that tubular material. Um, that would be mounted to the face of that, uh, the wood rail. That's a conversation that you would have with the planning board. It's, it needs to be, uh, they okay. need to decide what um, they're going to approve. You need to tell them what you want to do. Okay, that's fair. I, I, as I say, we were scrambling and, and at, as I say, it's not an excuse for our office, but we were focusing on the interior layout of the building for the owners and jumped onto the site 
issues uh, a little bit late in the game. So, so I can certain, are, I can so are, are you uh, thinking you want to you you're likely to come back when things are finalized or? Well, what I, what I would like to, because of the compressed time, if there are a much smaller list of items that if we will certainly copy the board with all of the material, I don't know if it warrants a return to the pre-construction. You know, we would like to certainly initiate some of the work and get a building permit so that the units and the, the structural remediation can take place before we get too far into the season and we lose weather. Right. Um, so it's more, a, you know, it, it, it's, we're within a very short number of options right now, if it's, if it's down to these handrails that, and I'm already trying to determine the decking material that the owners would like to use in its suitability, I could certainly come back to the the board with a single sheet that is not dependent on the building uh, permit being issued for the bulk of the work. Right. And, well, we could also basically, as a condition, require you to make the handrail detailing consistent yep. across the entire front of the building. So yes. That they all feel like they are part of the same aesthetic. That's fair. I mean, I, I have no problem with that. And it, and it will be more heavily guided by the frame versus a concrete mounted rail. Right. Okay, so we've, uh, we've now got three hands up. Um, Chris, I'm gonna call on you first, just I think you just resolved the issue. If they make the handrails all consistent and they all comply with ADA requirements, I think that's fine. And I can put that in a letter. Okay. All right. Uh, so board members, let us know if you don't agree with that solution. Uh, Janet, I see your hand. So, you know, the idea of having concrete tubing for the handrails and concrete walkways sounds very institutional to me. And this is kind of a little colonial style building and it's like a transitory home for people. So I would go with the decking that looks like wood. I would go with the handrails that you'd see commonly on someone's house um, mm -hmm. and not do the, the tubing and the kind of institutional look. I think we're trying to make it, you know, fit into the colonial vibe of that part of Amherst and make people feel like they belong in a home, you know, and there's some plantings and there's some grass and it's just not this institutional setting. So I, that would be kind of a strong preference on my part. I don't know if other people think, agree. Okay, thanks, Janet. Uh, Chris? I would be concerned about this being um, not someone's individual home, but more of an institutional type of building, even though we may not like that characterization. But my concern is that the handrails meet the um, handicapped requirements. So I guess you could say that you're good with whatever type of handrail that they want to use, as long as it meets handicapped requirements. That makes sense? Yes. No, I'm just, I'm just stating you know, make it look as good as possible for people so they feel welcome and, you know. Yep, cared for. Yeah, not not the cheapest or most institutional looking thing, which I think happens a lot for people at the sort of lower economic scale. Okay, thanks, Janet. Larry? Yes, and, and I would just comment that that is precisely what the applicants have put before me. I was... I was going for, let's just do something that we is tried and true and, and more mass produced. And they were looking for that residential mm -hmm. level and aesthetic. And so that's what we're, 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 we're going to meet in a common ground area that's going to be code compliant. But we'll happily share that with the board. Okay, thank you. Chris? I just wanted to point out that there was a drawing, um, D-2A, that showed an ornamental steel handrail at the steps. 
So it wasn't just the tubular version. It was something that actually had um, posts and it had kind of a circular pattern at the top. Um, and it was included in your packet. Yeah. Uh, drawing D-2A. So that would be kind of a third version of a handrail to consider. Was that part of the original submission or part of the uh, latest? I think it was part of the original. That was in the original. Yeah, I have. So that really, they are showing three different types of handrails. They just have to decide on one. There it is up in the upper left hand right. corner. There. So yeah. that would be a more decorative type of handrail. It's similar to what I have at my house. Um, it's not the typical tubular, but it does have those tubular protrusions at the top and the bottom, which satisfy the handicap requirements. Um, and it could be painted any color that you like. So I'm just right. putting that forward as a as an yep. option. That satisfies my concerns. Thank you. Yeah. Are you, uh, so are you willing to use this type of detail throughout, Larry? Oh yes, that I mean that is compliant with um, the safety of the use of the stairs and or uh, yeah. ramp. So it certainly is capable of doing that, and it can be fit to uh, the depiction is uh, a mounting that is in uh, again it would be a concrete uh, pier or something of that nature, but we would be doing a, a wood frame, right? Uh, so yes, that can be adaptable to that. All right. Well, it sounds like uh, Janet would be okay with that. And uh, I think uh, I share Chris's concern about having consistency across the front of the building. So yep. maybe we can just reference that as the type of the style of railing we'd like to see. Sure. <clears throat> okay, are there any other parts of this uh, project that we need to focus on, Chris? Um, what about the gable, uh, what about the light at the gable end of the building? The uh, suggestion had been, I think it was Mr. McDougall who suggested that light because there is going to be a trash uh, dumpster yeah. in that location and he thought the dumpster needed some light because people may be bringing their trash out at night so right and i want to share that memory and also the concern uh, i see bruce nodding his head as well bruce i was going to say that until chris said because uh, we we wanted to make sure that that it, we asked whether it would be uh, possible the applicant said it would and i think we made it uh, therefore a condition and so therefore uh, all of that deliberation was done for that reason, and we should not abandon it. Yeah. And I saw the this galleon wall-mounted fixture in the packet. So is that the type of fixture you would put on the gable, Larry? Uh, what we were hopeful of doing is similar to at the entries, we would use the wall sconce with the motion detection so that it was not something that would be lit on a constant level. Um, it, it is more, I don't know if there's a depiction of that wall sconce. It's, mm -hmm. it's those are the parking lot lights that yeah. were going through, but it, this would be a, a cylinder fixture that would direct light predominantly to the, the ground level with a, a minimal amount of throw. And uh, according to Connor, uh, and other staff members that uh, the staff is controlling the access to the dumpster. So it would be during specific times, it would actually be a locked uh, and gated uh, dumpster. It's not on a whim that someone just goes and, and dumps a bag of trash in there. Um, so there would be some element of control when, when that would be utilized but there would be lighting there that would be activated by motion. So if someone did feel the necessity to get out there with a bag of trash, that they would not be in darkness. But a constant light coming off the building was looked to be 
a negative because it would be directed straight out towards the street. Well, I'm also seeing on the photometric plan that the uh, that fixture at the west end of the parking lot yeah. is providing some level of light over. Yeah, to I mean the you're dumpster. over in many locations, it looks like you're at least one lumen and it, it's closer to two in several cases. Yeah. So I don't know if the that light on the building is as positive a source. Um, there is a light presently that's in the, uh, the decorative uh, framing that is in the bow shaped overhang of the roof, but it is directed straight out at the street. So we were going to eliminate that and do something on the face of the building so it would be consistent with as you turn the corner and go down the south exposure near all of the entries, you would have similar light levels on the building. <clears throat> all right, uh, Fred, I see your hand. Yeah, uh, how high above grade is the uh, gable end light? That right now is probably, I'm gonna say it, it's about 15 to to 18 feet above the ground. Because it, it's up in the, like the collar tie area of that framed roof. Yeah. I, I, I got to say the sconce feels like it's sort of inadequate to really do much. Well, yeah. it is. It's just that bringing that consistency of light level at the face of the building. And as you pointed out, we are getting some throw of light and measurable light levels from that pole light. Yeah, but the sconce is sort of a human scale yeah. picture that's you know adjacent to the doorway at the stoop. And it, uh, it's sort it's sort of the lighting for the uh, fire department connection on the end of the building and the bulkhead that's on that end of the building. Uh -huh. Fred, what do you think? Uh, I I think it probably should have a little greater amount of light projection. I don't I I'm missing the I saw foot candle uh, drawing of that gable, but um, uh, I I question whether uh, a conventional sconce that's 16 feet above grade is going to be uh, all that helpful to someone trying to. Oh, no, this trash bag. The, the sconce would be mounted in a similar height as along the face, the front or south face of the building, like at the entry. So it would be the human scale. If someone was walking towards the dumpster, it would be illuminating that walking path alongside the building. Oh, if that's that's why I asked the question about how high it was, and I was told. Oh no, the, 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 the no, that's where the current light is. Oh, the, the, no, I'm, I when I asked the question, I was referring to the one that we're talking about. Oh, the the sconces would be mounted more at like the top of door height, so seven, seven and, feet. And, and this one for the trash would be the same height. Correct. I got you. Thank you. Sorry. Sorry for the confusion. I thought you were asking what the current light is, and it's it's an LED light that just shines directly out from the building, and it's up in that height of the gable. All right. Uh, Bruce? Um, I think that uh, you could use a 20 or 30 watt um, uh, LED uh, wall pack type uh, fixture, the one you've got shown, and uh, you could um, have it horizontal or even tipped slightly toward the building. And if you were to mount that at about 12 feet, um, it would substantially illuminate the wall and then, then the wall would reflect the light back more generally. And I think that would probably be the best way to create the kind of uh, illumination that we're talking about on that end of the building. I agree with uh, Doug that the uh, 
uh, uh, sconces out of character there. It's it's yeah, it's uh, it's a, it's a, it, the end of the building is not like the doorways. There are no intimate entries there, mm -hmm. uh, and it would be confusing to have a sconce there. I think it would look rather silly. Um, so I would uh, suggest that you use the fixture that you've already uh, scheduled. You okay? And uh, um, and and then just make sure that it's mounted uh, or tipped so that the uh, plane of the uh, light is delivering itself against the uh, against the face of the building. Because I don't think there are any windows there, are there? Certainly not at that height. No, there, there's not going to be windows on that end uh, so in you can, the renovation. So there, you're not shining into any of the units. Yeah, uh, so could could that be on a motion detector so that I, it's not on all the time because it. It just seems. I, yes, I would think so. I mean, uh, okay. because then you can always change that. That's a control thing, and and if yeah. anybody, but I I think that the uh, you know the 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 uh, the, the the lighting design uh, solution concept there, particularly with no windows at that end, would be to use the plane of the building as essentially sure. the, the 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 illumination the reflector. plane. Yeah. So you you put a strong light against that wall, and then the wall reflects it out, and you. Don't have any glare. You do have light, and and everybody's happy. Okay. Well, everybody but me, because uh, <laughs> because I'm looking at these elevations, and I'm looking at the west elevation, and there's three windows on the end of the building, and there's a unit. There, there's three existing windows that are being infilled, so it will be a solid wall. So this elevation the is not correct. That is correct. That is one of the, the corrections that we're we're rapidly trying to complete uh, so that the building, in fact, we had that discussion on Tuesday uh, as to whether or not uh, they wanted to retain one or all of the windows or none of the windows. And, and the consensus from the applicant was none. So. All right. Well, that you realize that prompts me to ask, what else about these elevations is not correct? Um, we we are going to be. We drew the uh, the roof in the what is the eastern section of of the parcel that is owned by the applicant. There are some structural issues in the roof. We are going to basically replace that damaged section of roof so that we can match the existing profile of the building. So we are we're going through that process and have those details, which is uh -huh. what I why I prefaced that we had not building permit ready drawings at this point because of discoveries that were made only days ago. All right, so you're going to rebuild it in the profile so that the slope matches the rest of the roof, but it will Correct. be lower as shown on this drawing? Yes. All right. Are, there, are all the windows that are shown on the south and north elevation correct? They should be, they yeah, should be correct for the units at this point. I wonder if Pam could bring up that um, drawing. It's A201, exterior yeah. elevations. I was trying. I don't, I don't see it. It was in the architectural package that was sent. That's why. Yep, it's not the, not the Levesque. There package. we go. Yeah, it's probably like 8 of 10 or something like that. What was the number again? A what? A201. Two. There, there it is. is. Whoops, yeah. That was it. Back. Go back. Yeah. There you go. Thank yep. you. And yeah. yes, those windows are correct with the exception of the west elevation. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. All right. So now I'm happy. How about that? All right. Bruce, are you all set? Oh, yep. All right, so so we've asked you to use a, a wall-mounted sconce. Yep. 12 or 14 feet up. Yep. Mostly in, in, down. in the gable, but use the same fixture as in the rest of the parking lot on a wall-mounted basis. Yes. Yep. All right. 
All right, Pam, you think you have that? Those notes? <clears throat> the only thing that I missed was um, how high up did you say? Did you say 12 feet? Well, I, 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 I said 12 feet. 12 or 14 feet. It needs to be kind of up in the yes. center of that oh. gable. So 12 to 14, and Pam, I uh, think it's important to also say that the plane of the light be uh, directed back slightly toward the building. Okay. Okay. Light tipped toward the building. <laughs> Excuse me. Okay. Uh, I have one other question just to clarify, because I thought we were moving away from the word sconce and moving toward wall pack does that matter as long as it's the same fixture as being used in the parking lot i yeah, would I, not use the word sconce i think that does have a domestic interior sound right. to it uh, okay um exterior fixture is fine wall mounted exterior wall mounted fixture. wall yeah. mounted fixture okay thank you <clears throat> Okay, uh, does anybody have anything else we need to talk about on this submission? I think we've touched on all the areas that we asked you to come back for. Mm -hmm. And in, in the conditions, and again, it, it was on the fly interpretation that there would still be conditions that would be present and were required for the permit application, one of which is a, a fire safety plan and, and other things that are, are code compliant uh, for any application for a building permit. And those things are being worked on, but would not necessitate another full board meeting because it's going to be a requirement of the fire department or building department. Is that yes, a I, correct interpretation? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Anything to comment, Chris? Are you on board with that? I'm, on, I'm okay, yep. Okay. Okay, all right. Uh, in that case. So I would, I would guess that I would forward the corrected elevation uh, and uh, call out the uh, incorrect photometrics as well as provide a, a sheet of a consistent railing to Christine to yes. satisfy then the board. Yes. Okay. Yep. We'll, you, we'll you, get those put together. Receive it and review it and decide whether we need to see it again. Okay. But thank you. So thank you, Connor, and thank you, uh, Mr. Tuttle. And uh, good luck with your project. Thank you. We're, we're, we're working diligently to get that done. <laughs> Great. I, I hope you make your uh, winter deadline. Uh, we've got we've got quite a crew out there working diligently. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. OK, so the time now is 748, 46. And um, next item on our agenda is uh, also old business, any topics not reasonably anticipated 48 hours in advance? Anything no topics. You want to say, Chris? No topics, nope. All right. <clears throat> How about new business? Any similar topics not anticipated? No. All right. Form A, A and R subdivision applications. Anything new to share? No. Okay. ZBA applications, other than the Shootsbury project that we've all talked about? We do. I have a couple of slides um, that I made. I was just made aware of a couple. Let me. Okay. So this, the first one is um, 19 Research Drive. Actually, let me start by just saying that both of these applications I'm gonna show you are expected to go to ZBA on September 14th. The first one um, is 
at 19 Research Drive, which you might recall. Um, why do I say existing to family? I think I didn't do something correct here. Let's look at this. So what's happening is this particular building, it has um, a manager's apartment on it and they want to increase the size of the manager's apartment. It's gonna go, they're proposing to increase it from 660 square feet to 1,106 square feet. And that increase um, triggers the ZBA to grant a special permit. The increased space is happening because the office suite adjacent to it is actually downsizing. So they're gonna have a little extra room. So they'd like to make that manager's apartment a little bit bigger. And they're saying that it is only living space. They are not adding an additional bedroom. And, and am I right that uh, the expansion of this apartment will be into the office area? That is correct. So, so the, from the outside, the building won't look any different. That is correct. All right. So uh, board members, I don't know how you feel. I, I can say I'm not particularly interested in seeing that. Doesn't sound like anything worth our time. Okay. So I see Bruce shaking his head basically in agreement. What's, what's the next one? So this next one is at 65 Taylor Street, and it is an existing two family. Um, and what they would like to do, let me see if I can show you a better picture. They have this barn space and this converter space here. They actually want to add a third unit. This connector space would be totally rebuilt. And the barn, they're actually going to keep the bones of the barn and the unit would be sort of a second floor floor unit. So here's the existing house, which has two units in it now. So they would take the connector unit, which is about here. The first floor of the connector unit would be the kitchen. The second floor of the connector unit would be the living room. And then there would be a bedroom area at the top of the barn, sort of a loft area. And underneath, they would retain two parking spaces. They're actually proposing eight parking spaces for this area. So there's four existing, two that are in that lower barn area. And then they're going to reconfigure and take away uh, some of this driveway area to add two more parking spaces. I could not find a picture of that, though. All right. So the overall mass of the building will not change. That is correct. Nope. Okay. All right. Uh, does anybody think this is worth uh, our seeing? Janet. I feel like I should know it after all those zoning amendments, but will there be owner occupancy on this converted dwelling to three units? That is correct. It is owner occupied now and the owners will actually um, occupy the new unit, unit number three. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. All right, uh, Fred. <laughs> well, this brings back memories because I used to own this building. <laughs> and uh, and I, I think it's a good plan. Um, but uh, yeah, I, there's uh, many stories I can tell about this building that I owned in the uh, 1980s, so all right, I know all about it. Okay, so does that mean you maybe don't need to hear more about it? <laughs> no, I don't. I don't think. I think the ZBA can handle this. Yeah. Okay, Bruce. Um, uh, I think probably the ZBA can handle this as well. I'm just a little curious because, if I understand the building code correctly, this becomes a triplex. Um, which would mean, as I, as I think, that the whole building would have to be fitted with a residential sprinkler system. And so um, it would seem almost as though it would be better to have a sufficient separation between the existing two family and, the, and what's new in order to avoid that uh, 
yeah. disruption of the two existing units, which would be considerable. So it, it, it my guess is that, uh, I'm, I'm, anyway, I, I, I just find this very peculiar, uh, and I, but I, I think it's clear that they are proposing one big massive building. I just, I wonder whether they, whether, 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 whether my analysis is correct or not. And if, if, if it is, and they don't understand it, that they might come back with a different solution at some point. Yeah. Mr. Colton, it is my understanding that part of their um, project and proposal is a complete sprinkler system. Chris, you may correct me if I am incorrect. I don't know that for sure, but I would suspect it is because um, Nate Malloy and Rob Mora have talked to these yeah. applicants um, quite thoroughly about what's going on here. All right. Fred? Uh, yeah, that uh, is quite true. It'd be a 13R. It's not a full NFPA 13 system. It's a 13R system, which is... Uh, uh, more restrained and, and lower in cost uh, than a regular NFPA 13 system. But yeah, there are going to be sprinklers in there. Yeah. All right. So actually, Janet. <clears throat> Can Fred interpret, explain what he just said in lay terms? Uh, Janet, I think the basic uh, message is that this the type of sprinkler system that's required in a residential building like this is not as comprehensive and expensive as a sort of commercial or institutional sprinkler uh, installation would be in a in that type of building. Okay. I believe you can use plastic piping, for example. Yeah. What would do you have a sense of how much that would cost? Because I hear this issue raised often like the cheaper system? I do not. Um, I used to, but I bet it's wrong now. Yeah. <laughs> okay. okay. More than it used to. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I can confirm, I'm looking at the application here, that a wet sprinkler system in accordance with NFPA number 13D, um, installation of sprinkler systems in one and two family dwellings in manufactured homes, Installing sprinklers on exposed piping in all areas where concealing the piping is not feasible. Um, installing concealed pendant sprinklers in all areas with new finished ceilings being installed. And it will be, and it's going to be tested. Yep. All right. Well, I have, I'm sure that Rob Mora can work out the sprinkler system details with the applicant. It does sound mm -hmm. like they're aware of it. Uh, but I haven't heard anybody on the board say that they particularly want this to come back with the applicant explaining what they're doing to our board. So I think we can let this one go too, Pam. Okay. Super. That's all I have for you. All right. All right. Great. Uh, time now is 7.56. I'm thinking we probably don't need to take a break and we can probably get through the rest of our agenda pretty expediently without the break this evening. Uh, any Anybody that wants to stop, please raise your hand. Uh, but uh, if not, I'll, I'll just continue here. Um, so the time now is 7.56 and where we were up to item eight on the agenda, upcoming SPP, SPR, SUB applications. So the only one that comes to mind right now is the 395 West Street. It's property owned by Ron Laverdier and his father, and it is just north of um, a new building that was built a few years ago down in the Pomeroy Village intersection. Um, Ron is proposing uh, a nine-unit apartment building at 395 West Street, um, and he's coming in, I think he's coming in tomorrow to show me and Rob Mora, the application um, with the hope that he's going to be submitting it soon and it would be a site plan review um, because it's in the RVC zoning district. There's a little chunk of RVC zoning district just north of, of Ron's property. So um, that's the yeah. only one that I can think of. All right. And when do you, when do you think that'll actually come to us? Will it be September or October or? 
Um, I think it will be probably September, depending on how many other things you have going on. All right. Um, and Nate is here, and he may be. Yeah, Nate's, Nate's able to... even raised his hand. What do you want to say, Nate? <laughs> So I was going to say 86 Gray Street, 86 Gray Street is another site plan review application that's, I think, pretty ready, pretty much ready to proceed. It um, is an expansion of a two-family owner-occupied duplex. And so it's, you know, we're putting on a first floor addition. Um, okay. And that's that's one. So and then the other one, one. Actually so sooner than the other one? <clears throat> yeah, I think they're all, they're, I think that one could happen um, sooner. Okay. All right, <clears throat> so we'll move on. Planning board committee and liaison reports. So uh, at, just as a reminder, we're gonna, we will probably be uh, electing our officers and the representatives to the various committees uh, at our next meeting, the one in person on August 30th. So, uh, Feel free to think about whether you want to volunteer for a committee or you want to nominate someone else or as an officer. Um, so of the people we still have on the board and uh, uh, Bruce, you want to say anything about PVPC? Uh, no meeting, nothing to report. All right. So we have CPAC and the DRB vacant. Uh, Janet, anything about the solar bylaw? Um I missed the last meeting, so Chris would have a bigger update. But I do know that we had um, the uh, town attorney met and talked to the committee about like, you know, what about farms and forests can be regulated and things like that. And so I think I'll defer to Chris. I'm, I'm listening to the tape now, but I wonder if Chris can fill in for me. Um, yeah, we, we sent the uh, attorney some specific questions about what could and couldn't be regulated and how. And he responded in writing and then he came back and gave a presentation about it. So um, after that, it was a very long meeting. It was a three hour meeting. So the first hour was the, the attorney. And then we talked a lot about, well, what does this mean for farmland um, and how could we um, regulate that? And then I'm, I can't remember how the, how the last part of the meeting went, but there were some public comments and um, the, the group as a whole is really zeroing in on how to regulate <clears throat> solar array, arrays on farmland and in forest, uh, forest land. Okay. All right. Uh, and then Chris, anything on CRC you wanna share? I don't accept that they did deliver their proposal for the rental registration um, update to town council and town council, um, I believe referred it to the finance committee and one other committee, maybe GOL, I think that was right. Um, but anyway, it's it's being uh, evaluated by the committees of the town council and then it will come back to town council for um, further discussion. All right. Okay, the next item, report of the chair. Um, I don't have very much to say this evening. I will say uh, I'd heard from Chris that there was some uh, maybe confusion or questioning from some of the public about what kind of conversation we are likely to have at our next meeting and the uh, other two in-person meetings that we've agreed to hold uh, to talk about how we might change the zoning in town. Um, I gather there was some, some uh, thought that maybe we would be taking the duplex, uh, triplex proposal that uh, Mandy Joe and Pat DeAngelis had proposed and focusing on that. And uh, I at least thought we would be going in a, a probably a different direction uh, looking at where we could up, up zone areas to allow greater density, uh, much greater density than just going from a single family to a duplex. Um, so board members, uh, you know, I guess if you have any expectations about what we might talk about uh, at the next meeting, you could share them now or you could just arrive with those expectations and help us guide the conversation. Uh, but I thought we might be going 
further afield than duplexes and triplexes. Bruce. Yes, so did I. Uh, but um, I've got two things that I could bring. Uh, and I, Doug, I'll forward them to you uh, sometime in the next week or so. One is that um, when I started thinking about uh, this, I I uh, felt it was in, important to me anyway to try and understand a little clearer, a little better and succinctly, just what are the levers that we as a planning board uh, have to pull, so far, metaphorically speaking, so far as... Uh, uh, creating or inducing incentivizing uh, affordable uh, housing of one sort or another. So I wrote a, I wrote myself a memo of all of the things that I thought we could. And it, I was thinking about it differently than I used to think about it as an architect or as a, as a consultant supporting development professionals. And I thought about it more from a citizen planner and governance, uh, civic uh, governance point of view what levers do we have as a planning board or as a municipal entity, as opposed to, I don't know, a developer or an architect or a builder, because there are certain things builders can do. Uh, there are different things that we can do. And I wanted to better understand what I thought our, 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 our um, opportunities were. So I, I will give you that and you can decide how much uh, use it is. And the second thing is I've had uh, another now five conversations totaling with uh, people, for, uh, planners from other towns. And I'm hoping that Bob Mitchell will help me get to the, the person in Burlington. And I've, uh, I'm going after people in Mankato, uh, Minnesota, and in uh, um, Oxford, uh, Ohio for Miami University. And so by the end of the month, I'm hoping that I'll have uh, six or seven I've had six or seven of these conversations with uh, uh, Councilman, so, so I could give some, uh, not specifically a report, but I can feed that, uh, that, that what I've learned, what I think I've learned from those conversations into the conversation that we as a board would have. Um, I'm planning to be able to do that. Okay, that sounds great, Bruce. And everyone, uh, bring your ideas. Uh, I will say that in the last such meeting that the board had, we uh, we had focused, I think, a lot of our conversation on Belchertown Road uh, and uh, whether that area from its intersection with East Street, uh, even 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 just starting at the uh, the Eversource uh, substation and going east from there along College Street, and then it turns into Belchertown Road on the far side of East Street, um, whether that whole stretch could be upzoned for greater, you know, greater density, probably four or five stories, and how, how deep would we go, and should it be they may mixed use, or could they be purely residential? Um, so that seemed to be the direction that the previous board was thinking about. Um, just for Jesse and Fred's information. All right, so that's really what I wanted to say in my uh, chair's uh, report. Um, Janet, I saw your hand for a moment. Did you want oh, to say something? And Yeah, did you, I missed that meeting and I don't think, I think those are the missing minutes maybe, but um, did they talk about uh, like increasing density at existing apartment complexes? Because there's a few, even at East, at that intersection, there's a couple there and they're already, you know, developed. And I just wondered if that was part of your conversation. Yeah, we didn't really, I, I don't remember us focusing on or really talking about the existing uh, complexes. I think, you know, there was a lot of discussion about how, uh, I think it was Tom Long who lives at the East End, you know, somewhere up uh, off of Belchertown Road and drives past that stretch a lot and noticed that a lot of it was all, most all of it was all uh, student rentals already and uh, was just thinking that it could be more, probably more uh, densely developed and more professionally managed if it was with, if they were larger complexes. Uh, we did, we did, I think we talked about that uh, that 
derelict commercial property that's uh, on Belchertown Road. And, um, you know, I know at one meeting you had talked about trying to contact that owner. Um, and uh, I, I don't remember that happening. I don't think that was me. It was okay. Karen. Was it Karen? Okay. So anyway, um, I don't remember too much discussion of the existing larger complexes, although we acknowledged that they were there. Chris. So we do know that um, Colonial Village is planning to um, <laughs> add units to their uh, development. They have, I think they have 90 units now, and I believe they're planning to add 84 units. Wow. So that will be a pretty big um, development there. And they're going to be including affordable units. Nate might know the exact number, but I believe it's nine or 10. Wow. So that, that will be a big, um, what should I say, influx to that area. Mm -hmm. And we also have a Mass Works grant to improve the sidewalks along both sides of the road of Belchertown Road um, for about, what is it, 1,000 feet or 1,500 feet, something like that. And um, yeah, it seems to me that we're asking someone for money to do something else at, in Belchertown Road. So there are other things happening there. And of course, the Fort River School is going to be built. And so there are, there are a lot of changes that are happening in that area. So it's a good area to focus on. And, you know, this is not to say that we have to focus on that. I'm just, I just wanted to bring everybody up to speed on where we, where we were in the last time. And we obviously have a new board. To, we can go whichever way it wants. Okay. Um, report of staff. Chris. I don't really ha have a report tonight. Excuse me. Okay. Uh, time is 8.09. Uh, Karen, I see your hand. I wanted to, since there are putting in sidewalks and putting adding all those apartments. I wonder if we can, before it's too late, request that they take a look at adding a bicycle path on the sidewalk as part of the sidewalk. So we have a real side, uh, real bicycle path into town. You know, just coming back from Berlin where this is done all over the place, I keep thinking we need to really watch out now that our bicycle, that the sidewalks when they're made that part of them can be bicycle tracks because people like mothers with children, just people are too timid to ride their bicycle on the street. Um, yeah, is there anything we can do to let them look at that right now? Chris? I think that's gonna be part of the um, design for that part of the road. Um, again, Nate may know more about it because he's the one who made the application to MassWorks, but it tends to be these days that um, either we have bike lanes on the road or we have a multi-use path. You'll notice that the new work that's being done along Route 9 between the center of town and University Drive includes one side of the road where the um, sidewalk is very wide, and that's going to be a multi-use path so people can ride their bikes there and they can also walk there. And I think that there are also going to be some narrow uh, bike lanes on either side of that road too. So I, I believe that we will be, if not required, then very strongly encouraged to um, have bike infrastructure on that portion of Belchertown Road. Okay. That's great. Great. Thanks. All right. Thanks, Karen. Okay. I don't see any more hands. We've gotten through our agenda. Time is 8.11. Unless anybody objects, I think we can adjourn. Good night. Thank, everybody. thank you all thank you. and have, have a good summer Bye. or the rest of your summer. I'll see you in two weeks. Uh, we'll be in person. Bye-bye. Good night. Goodbye. Bye. Bye. Good, Bye. good night. Uh, Do you want to stop recording?